Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in Southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thank you for joining us for this final edition of Your Legislators for this session. I'm Fred Martino, very pleased to have you with us. The session ends next week, and for our final show, I'm very pleased to have with us Senator Howie Morales. Senator, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here every year. It just seems like they just come pretty quickly. They sure do. They sure do. And this has been, uh, of course, a, an interesting session so far, a short one. We're going to get to a host of legislation that you've introduced uh, during this session. But first, I do want to get a budget update. As you know, uh, the House has passed a budget, uh, but there are big differences between that budget and the budget proposed by the governor. Uh, for instance, one that affects a lot of people, the governor uh, had proposed a 1% cost of living adjustment for state workers. The House uh, doubled that and proposed a 2% uh, cost of living adjustment for uh, state workers, slightly higher for teachers, uh, and closer to the average uh, national uh, increase in uh, pay of about 3%. Uh, can these differences be, be worked out, particularly on the, the pay increase and any other major differences with the governor's uh, budget? I'm confident they can be worked out, but it really is a commitment of the of the legislature to make sure that we can take care of those individuals who are taking care of our state, our employees, our our teachers, our educational assistants, all those individuals who've been working for years and haven't seen any of the the um, changes come in. This is important that we place that two to two and a half percent uh, increase into their pay, and so I feel that they can be worked out. And, and the LFC, which is a committee that I sit on, um, has been working on this, and, and I believe that um, it's something that needs to be done. We need to show value to all of our employees across the state, especially at a time when uh, when we're barely getting out of this recession. So uh, you think that. If, if the Senate uh, agrees with the House with the higher uh, amount of uh, cost of living adjustment, uh, they will be able to convince the governor to do this. I believe strongly that the governor needs to be convinced to do this. Um, again, is that there hasn't been any substantial pay increases for any uh, individual across the state of New Mexico. Now's the time to do it. If we don't invest into our people, we're going to continually see people leave to other states and other opportunities. This is something that, that we have to do, um, and I'm hopeful that the governor will agree. Okay. We want to move on to some other issues because uh, you have introduced a whole host of really important measures. One of them, uh, a lot of folks watching will be very interested in, involves net neutrality. The idea that we treat all internet traffic equally. The FCC threw this out and uh, states now are taking action, including uh, one of our biggest, New York. New York said, wait a minute, we're going to have net neutrality in the state of New York. You said we should, we should have it in the state of New Mexico and introduce legislation to ensure this. Tell me about this bill and, and where this stands. Absolutely. Today, uh, when I'm done with this interview, I'll be going into Senate Rules Committee to make that point and to argue the fact that New Mexicans deserve to have equal opportunity access to the Internet. When the FCC ruled on this, this just really puts in, you know, a, a unfortunate occurrence for New Mexico, especially our rural areas, who may only have one Internet service provider. When you start working um, through the FCC's uh, amendments and what they've done, 
this just drives up the cost for people, for students to use uh, for their studies, for consumers to use to purchase goods, for seniors to use when they can't get out of their home um, to have the opportunity to have access to this. I believe very strongly that the FCC approach to it was, was fraudulent. I thought what they did was, was borderline criminal because they took that protection for New Mexicans and all individuals across the country and put it in the hands of, of these uh, big corporations that can drive up the cost. You know, in addition to driving up the cost, as you know, Senator Morales, there's also a concern with uh, getting rid of net neutrality protections that folks may not have access to information that they have right now. So, for instance, we have uh, at, at the station a website, krwg.org. Uh, with the notion of net neutrality, our website is not treated differently because we can't afford to send a payment to internet service providers to make sure that folks can access our website uh, as quickly as other sites, uh, commercial sites. Uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I think again that's part of the, the issue why I brought it forward is because now you're going to limit what individuals can afford to what they can receive. Right now the, the internet is open and so if you want to access YouTube or Netflix or Facebook, why should you have to pay more for that uh, simply because the internet service provider wants to make another dollar off of you and this is what net neutrality is all about is protecting that open and access um, availability of the internet and utilizing it for whatever the individual may feel is important to their daily needs. Now of course in a short session it's very difficult to uh, get legislation <coughs> passed. If, if this does not pass during this uh, session in our final week here, do you have hope that, that it can pass in the next session uh, with a new governor? Well, you know, one thing is I would have hoped that the governor would have given us a message 20-some days ago because this would have shown her, her um, desire to protect New Mexicans from these price hikes uh, from Internet service providers. We didn't get a message, so I have a joint resolution that's in place right now that will ask our congressional delegation to look it over. I absolutely think that if it doesn't get through this session that this will be a priority for me next year. I am also running for lieutenant governor, so I would hope to have a hand in, in the administrative decisions to make sure we can protect New Mexicans. So whether I'm in the Senate or in the lieutenant governor role, this will continue to be a priority for us in this next coming session. Okay, I want to talk about another priority for you, uh, one that's concerning a lot of families right now in New Mexico. Of course, the cost of attending a state a university has risen for many families because of the fact that the lottery scholarship now is uh, down to 60% of tuition when it was uh, almost the entire bill for tuition. You have a, a legislation for a college affordability endowment fund. Tell me about that and, and what that's all about and again your hopes on that uh, this session or, or next if it doesn't pass this time. We, we, we desperately need to put funds into this area. This is an endowment fund that had to be rated whenever we hit the recession and needed to find dollars to just balance our budget. Currently if we don't put any money in there this endowment fund will go um, to zero. And so that's a concern because those students who aren't able to receive a Pell Grant, um, who don't qualify for some of the assistance that's out there, and they're the ones that fall through the cracks. And I'm really concerned that they won't have an opportunity to get an education simply because they can't afford it. We need to change course in New Mexico. We need to make sure that we're educating students, giving them every possible option to attend higher ed, to attend any uh, a school of their choice to better um, uh, prepare themselves for an educational opportunity that would lead to successful lives. This is important. This is a piece that really Legislative Finance Committee needs to look at and I'll continue to make it a priority because these students are the exact students that would want to go to college, would succeed in college, but just can't afford it if this endowment fund's not in place. Another measure that you've proposed uh, again this year, Senator Morales, would also uh, be helpful in terms of the state's finances. You have proposed a, a tax on tobacco, which has very wide support among the public and also among health professionals who say that it would be helpful in terms of reducing tobacco use as well 
as generating additional revenue. Tell me about your legislation to increase the uh, tobacco tax. You're correct on that. So this does have wide support across the state, and it's a win-win-win situation for, for New Mexico. This would generate $89 million, new dollars that would go into our classrooms that would help educate our children. It also would ensure that we have 11,000 kids never go into smoking because of cessation programs that could be in place. We would help adults who want to quit smoking um, to have a deterrent to, to do so. We ultimately lead, lead to a healthier New Mexico. I know that tax, taxes aren't always something that it's popular to talk about, but if there's one tax that really does have support, it's this one. And currently, as we sit right now, it's in a Senate Corporations Committee where we're at a 4-4 vote, and hopefully the opportunity we have to continue this discussion. The other thing is the state is being sued right now for insufficiently funding schools. $89 million would be a big shot in the arm to show that the state is doing all it's can, all, all we can, to um, put money into, into our school system. So it is a win-win-win situation, and I hope that the legislature will see this through and the governor sign that. Okay, well speaking of uh, education, I know this is a passion uh, for you. Uh, I know that uh, we share uh, the fact that we both uh, went to New Mexico State University and uh, received a degree. Uh, in education from, from New Mexico State. Go Aggies, I know you, you would agree with that. Uh, I, I, wanna, I wanna ask you about another uh, proposal that you've put forth, and that is to create an early learning department. Uh, I, I haven't, I'm guessing a lot of people have not heard much about this yet. I've, I've carried this piece of legislation for three years and sitting on the finance committee um, and the education committee, I, I see the need for it. We have a public education department, we have a higher education department, but we don't have a focus on the early stages, the most critical stages of a person's life, and that's the early childhood stages. All I'm trying to do is, it's not going to be growing government, we just consolidate services that are right now in four areas, public education department, human service department, department of health, um, as well as, is, um, uh, you know, as far as bringing these all together, we want to make sure that we can have it in one umbrella with experts who understand what it means to have education. CYFD's responsibility, for example, is, is enforcement and protection. It's not in the education piece. and, and this gives us an opportunity to consolidate all these dollars into one department and really focus to make sure that we can best educate our children at the most critical stages. As you know, the House has uh, approved using part of the permanent fund to uh, help fund education, uh, primarily early childhood education. Where do you stand on this? It's come to our, our committee and Senate Finance in the past, and, and I voted for it every time. I understand the financial concerns that are out there in doing so, but the reality of it, look at what we're paying out in corrections. Look at what we're paying out in, in issues like substance abuse and teenage uh, births. These, these kind of things that we're paying extremely high dollars to try to just get a handle on these. I think if we can invest as early as possible, we're going to start seeing the benefit for New Mexicans. We can sit on a permanent fund that is growing, and there's truth that it does grow as, as we go, but at the same time is what are we leaving behind and who are we leaving behind? This will be heard today as we speak in Senate Education Committee. I'm confident it'll pass. If it comes to my Senate Finance Committee, I will be supporting it again, and I would hope that our, our colleagues can send these to the voters for them to have the decision and to make the vote of whether they want the permanent fund to be spent, a portion of it, not all of it, but a portion of it to be spent into early childhood services. Okay. As you know, people speak very passionately uh, about education. Another issue that they're very passionate about is health care. And you have also taken action on this. Uh, you have uh, sponsored a Health Security Act in New Mexico. This essentially, if it were to pass, would be New Mexico's version of single-payer health care. Other states have done this. Tell me about your, your proposal and how this would work and your, your hopes for this uh, in the future. I know uh, at the federal level, as you know, there are a lot of people hoping for this. 
And I think that that is the discussion at the federal level, but I've been carrying this bill for about five years now, and it's important that we recognize that individuals have the right to have an opportunity to have health care. And to base health care on what you can afford, I think, is, is unfortunate. But in New Mexico, we have an opportunity to be a leader in, this, in the country. We often hear how we fall so far behind other states. This is an opportunity that we can ensure that our, our residents are well taken care of and that we can have a health care system that we can be proud of. This isn't necessarily a, a single payer model. This gives us the opportunity where we can have discussions in a co-op into that where people will have the ability to have their access to health care and at the same time save millions of dollars for New Mexicans. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on, on how it would work if it were to pass? Yeah, so basically the legislation that I have right now wouldn't put the whole Health Security Act into motion. What it does is, first of all, it gives us a fiscal analysis. So that way an in-depth study can be done to make sure that we're gonna, we can afford it, to make sure that the investment, the return on investment, is what we say it's going to be. So it's a first step uh, opportunity to do so. Upon the, the, the completion of that study, and we see where we stand at with the, with the dollars and that it makes financial sense for New Mexicans, then we would move into developing um, the, the Health Security Act and providing that New Mexicans can have an opportunity for equal access to health care, high quality of health care. And I believe that we can do this in the state of New Mexico, but first steps first, we want to make sure that the projections that I've been putting forward would become a reality and, and, and that's what I'm hoping will be done within the next couple sessions. Well, speaking of financial studies, as you know, last session, uh, the legislature voted to do a study on the gross receipts tax, but uh, unfortunately, uh, the tool uh, to do a financial analysis uh, by the firm hired is not yet ready. So uh, there has been, uh, as you know, an argument that there shouldn't be a, a comprehensive changes to the GRT. Uh, where do you see this uh, for this session? Are, are there, do you think there are going to be uh, any changes that will be made and are there any that you could support? As far as I see right now, we've been focusing on the budget here in the Senate Finance Committee. But as far as I see right now is, is I don't see any, any substantial changes. It's a 30-day session. It's the last year of an administration. And I don't see any substantial changes coming in. But I am hopeful in the interim to see what that study shows, what that uh, financial impact can give us, and how we can reform our, our tax system. I think there's some things that we can do to make it easier for business. I think there's things that we can do to make it easier for uh, uh, local governments. But until we actually have an idea of what that entails, it's very difficult to vote on it on the rush. We did that in 2013. We passed a corporate tax cut, which what we actually did is pass that, that tax onto local governments. And I want to make sure that we don't run into that same mistake again, because I voted against it then. And if it comes up in a rushed manner this year, I'll vote against it again. Has it surprised you, Senator Morales, that in this discussion there are some people who are raising the, the idea again of bringing back a tax on food. I think when you have the local governments that have been hit and having to raise taxes, one of their solutions is that they do a food tax and that would eliminate the concern that, that's been on the local governments and cutting services. But the reality of it is, is I haven't heard much of that discussion on the food tax. Not very popular. That's something that I don't see the legislature taking in and then I couldn't support a food tax that would be regressive on New Mexican families. Okay. You know, I, I also want to move uh, in terms of spending to another issue since we have time on uh, education that's very, a very interesting one. Uh, there is a push to limit administrative spending by schools because there are, there are wide, wide differences uh, uh, in different districts across the state in administrative spending. Uh, Folks who, who push for this say this could send more money to the classroom where, where they believe it belongs. How practical is this idea and, and do you support it? You know, I've talked to administrators and this goes back to the raises and I'm carrying the bill that would give a 2.5% raise to all of our employees. I've talked to many superintendents and in discussion with them, they don't even want the raise. They want that to be passed on to their to their 
um, employees, and I think that's very honorable of them. Now, it's, if there's glaring differences that we've seen in some school districts, and yeah, that's something that needs to be addressed, but those are still very small dollars. I think it's may, may basically sending a message that uh, that the school districts need to be fair to their employees, whether it's an educational assistant or a custodian or, or food service worker, and that they be, to be treated as fairly as an administrator. Um, but, but at the same time, you want to talk about big dollars coming into the education system. You want to talk about a huge impact that'll move the needle. That, that cigarette tax that I talked earlier about is one thing that can be huge dollars coming in. To be discussing and kind of saying that educators or administrators um, would send a whole lot of dollars to the classroom, yeah, it'll help. And I think that it's necessary, but we want to make a big difference on that. Let's really make the tough decisions and let's move on that. All right. I want to move to ethics and uh, transparency now. And uh, there's a bill to give a confidentiality to uh, records involving clients at Spaceport America. Uh, proponents of this uh, say that this is necessary to be uh, competitive with uh, some other states that may offer uh, more shielding of, of data. Uh, but as you know, opponents say, look, we already protect trade secrets uh, in current law. And this may go too far, for instance, in not being able to find out what a company is paying in rent at, at the spaceport. T tell me about this and, and your thoughts on this bill. There's concern with the spaceport, and we've got to see some action. We've got to see some movement there. And I think that there's efforts trying to be made to move in that direction. But the reality of it is it's being funded by New Mexico taxpayers. Dollars that could be going into our classroom, dollars that could be going into our healthcare systems are going in to, to support the spaceport. If New Mexicans are going to be um, uh, footing that bill, it's important that New Mexicans have access and make sure that it's uh, um, in a way that's transparent to ensure that we don't want to impede any business on there, but at the same time as we want to keep New Mexicans, who are the taxpayers, in the dark of what's taking place there as well. Okay, uh, as you know, there's also a proposal to uh, apply New Mexico's very broad uh, inspection of, of Public Records Act to the legislature. What do, what do you think about this idea? We're an open book, and I think, again, we're up here doing the people's work. It's a citizen legislature. Um, I'm open as far as transparency and, and whatever would need to be done. I haven't seen that bill. I don't know what the discussion is, as, as my focus has been on the finance side. But I've, I've always been um, one that want to make sure that we can have transparency available for, for the residents in New Mexico. Okay. We have a few minutes left, uh, Senator Morales. Is, is there a, another issue that you're passionate about that, uh, whether you've introduced legislation on it or not, that you haven't had a chance to talk about? There, there's two. I think one of the most important bills that we could have passed other than the budget was the nurse uh, licensure compact. This would have brought our healthcare system to its knees had we not passed this legislation, and I was fortunate to have been a co-sponsor on that. The first bill to pass this legislative session was Senate Bill 1, which was my bill. What this did is this allowed nurses, especially in New Mexico, who come in from other states to help fill the shortage, or nurses who live in New Mexico and, and travel across, maybe work in El Paso, or maybe work in Arizona or Colorado. This allowed them to be grandfathered into a licensed compact that we were a part of many years. There were changes that occurred to that, and if we didn't get this done by midnight Friday of the first week of the session, all those nurses would have lost the ability to practice within the state of New Mexico. Today, I'm proud to say that 3,000 nurses across the state of New Mexico are providing service to our patients and our residents of the state. And this is a real accomplishment that really took bipartisan support. And it took leadership on the behalf of the sponsors who helped carry that with me to make this a reality. So when we talk about what's been done in the session, that was a huge issue that I felt strongly about and fortunately got the support to get it signed by the governor. The other issue that I would like to talk about is, you know, I, I think that we had a crisis averted. We know what took place with behavioral health shutdown back in 2013 and the impact that it's had now with substance abuse, with crime rate, with uh, homelessness, with suicide. That was a tremendous impact because our system was shut down. Early January, the Department of Aging and Long-Term Services sent messages out that they were going to cancel the contract with the provider that, that did the services for providers across the state. 65 providers across the state that place Mills on Wheels, meals at the senior services centers, and uh, transportation to medical appointments. 
these were going to be canceled out. And I stood strong along with Representative Debbie Armstrong and said, this isn't going to happen. We're not going to do the same thing that we did to the behavioral health system. And we asked the governor to rescind this order. About two weeks ago, I get a message that said that the governor rescinded the order and that our services are going to continue just as they have. And I think that there's areas that we can improve. But most importantly, I think when we look and see what was important to us in our state, our education system, our children, our veterans, our individuals with disabilities, and our senior citizens have got to be at the forefront of that. And that was a huge accomplishment, I believe, with some cooperation from my Senate colleagues to make sure that we didn't go the same path that we did and the behavioral health shut down. Senator, I have a few minutes left and I want to touch on some very important issues relating uh, to voting and voter access. Uh, six states have a nonpartisan independent commission for redistricting. Common Cause New Mexico says that our state, New Mexico, should be number seven on that list. They and others say that redistricting should not be a political prize for the party in power and it's created enormous problems, including lawsuits, uh, one recently decided by the U.S. Supreme Court that told Pennsylvania your redistricting was illegal. Go back to the drawing board. What do you think about this idea of a nonpartisan independent commission for redistricting? I'm coming into my... I'm coming into my 11th year here in the, in the state Senate, and I can tell you I've been part of one redistricting process, and it's a grueling. You look at the data and you do all you can to, to make sure that you're as fair as possible in meeting the community of interest needs. Um, and, and so looking at, at going through redistricting again is something I'm not looking forward to. Um, I'm, I'm open to the discussion of an independent commission, but I want to make sure that we always keep in mind that it's just not the numbers that are there, that we've got to keep in mind that we're protecting those communities of interest, the poverty areas, the areas of minority, the areas of making sure that we are as fair as possible and ensuring that we have our districts well represented. If you can recall back at our last redistricting, we also went to court. We had a governor and Governor Martinez who was newly elected. From the Republican side, we have a, a House and a Senate that was controlled by Democrats. So there was obviously some disagreement on how those lines were drawn. We did go and there had to be some mediation of how we can have our district redrawn. And so I think that it would lend itself to the opportunity to have a fair approach to it. But until we see what that, uh, that um, proposal is, it's very hard to know exactly what that entails. Okay, Senator Howie Morales joining us from Santa Fe. Good luck with that final week of the session. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. Always a pleasure to talk to you as well, and thank you for the service you provide to the people of New Mexico. Thank you, Senator. And thank you to our viewers at home for joining us for your legislators during this session and for supporting your public television station. You can do that anytime at krwg.org or by calling us. Thank you so much. Have a great week.